my heart. Um, it's, it's edited by Keith Boykin, who he could not be here tonight. Uh, but basically, um, how in the, in the black community there's kind of like this uh, call and response, like if you're at church and someone is like really feeling the, uh, the message of the pastor, they'll say, yes, preacher. So this book is like a, a, a response to uh, a lot of deaths that happened in the LGBT community. And um, it deals with uh, various issues such as suicide, um, such as sexual abuse, coming out, um, racism, homophobia, and a really great package. My name is Victor Yates. I'm one of the contributors to the book. Um, I have uh, two uh, pieces in the book. Jonathan. Uh, kid. Um, I'm also a contributor. Uh, I'm a writer and I like good music and um, just try to be happy. <laughs> I'm Antonio Brown, another contributor in the book. Uh, I'm a writer producer. Hi, uh, my name is George Ortiz. I'm an actor and I'm a writer. Uh, the title of my story is Strange Fruit. And it's sort of semi-autobiographical. Uh, and as I like to say, I did not change the name, so if you think it's about you, it is. <laughs> <laughs> I see myself from above. I'm in this little room, and the door opens. He enters the room, light skin, and comes closer. His eyes. I never noticed the intensity, the beauty of his eyes. Drawing nearer, he parts his lips, preparing for the kiss. My 11-year-old self is now wide awake. Vince? Vince was a neighborhood bully, back when we had neighborhoods, bullies, and fistfights instead of drive-bys. I had bought into Dr. King's nonviolent message and applied it to my life. I never liked to fight, not terribly practical when surrounded by testosterone rock boys trying to grasp fleeting notions of manhood with tales of tapping that hoe or busting Pookie and them's ass in a street fight. And then there was Vince, who plagued me and my best friend, Kenny. Kenny and I would ride our bikes, play board games, eat candy, and hang for hours. Then Vince, who was at least three years older, would come along to spoil our days by taunting us with our shared nickname, Faggotry. My young mind's eye always saw a faggot tree dangling strange fruit. Even as a child, I had identified with Billie Holiday's torch song, Strange Fruit, a curious dirge depicting lynched victims swinging from poplar trees in the Jim Crow South. Vince's taunts of faggot tree sent shudders through my adolescent body, overwhelming my mind with images of cadaverous gay boys swaying like unholy ornaments in the towering oak tree that shadowed my family's backyard. My gut sank as I willed myself to shrink into invisibility. So what you punks want to do, Vince asked. We're hanging out, playing some games, about to go to my place and do some homework, Kenny said. Yeah, I'll bet. Faggotry. Kenny and I bristled and puffed up our chests. In response, Vince asked, what you gonna do? We looked at each other. Should we double team him? Could we take him down? But then what? I never understood street fights. I mean, how do you know who won? And unless someone died, when would it end? I could never see the point, so Kenny and I walked away, demoralized and angry, but proud to have taken the higher road. Yeah, I didn't think so, punks, Vince yelled at us. Kenny and I had lost our patience with Vince, but we convinced ourselves his accusations weren't true. We both had girlfriends, and many more girls pursued us with love notes handed our way, check here if you like Arnita, Cynthia, or Teresa, yes, no, maybe so. Vince didn't know what he was talking about. That summer, Vince's cousin Denise came to visit. She was my age, a cute brown-skinned girl with long braids and a mad crush on me. And she always smelled like my grandmama's banana pudding, complete with vanilla wafers. I would say I was 11 years old. I wouldn't say I was an 11-year-old on the down though, but I was still coming to terms with my gay self. I just didn't know. I didn't know that living in a loving relationship with another man was an option, and I wasn't clear if that was what I wanted. So I still went with girls, including Denise. One day, when we were kissing in the entry to my family's basement, 
We looked up, and every kid from the neighborhood, Tweet, Stank, Hoogie, Carmen, Tom Tom, and Estelle's entire crew, was in my backyard, ooing, eyeing, chanting, and cheering. Wait till Vince hears about this, someone said. I took the walk of shame through the crowd to escort Denise home, walking right into Vince along the way. The whole neighborhood had been waiting for this all summer. Would Pretty Tony bring it on or would he punk out? Vince was in our faces in an instant. Denise, what you doing hanging with this punk? I tried to walk around him with Denise in tow, but the neighborhood had gathered ready for a fight. Look, faggotry, I don't want you all up on my cousin. It's cool, Vince. We're heading home now, Denise said, and he definitely ain't no fag. Vince, unconvinced, looked around. You don't know what you're talking about. Tell her, he demanded. Tell her what, Vince, I asked. Look. I'm just walking her home, then I'm going home myself. You ain't going nowhere till you get past me. Folks were standing around like they paid money for this show. I already turned both cheats, and all it had gotten me was a sore ass. Was it time to fight? Before we could find out, my mother's voice called me from a distance to come inside. Everyone knew the fight was done. Vince never confronted me again. The summer passed, and soon he and his family moved away. By the time I made it to high school and college, those threats seemed far away. But college had its own challenges, including folks who were ready to shame me for being who I am. The fraternities and athletes became the new neighborhood bullies, still trying to scope out their manhood while standing on the necks of others. Although no one directly threatened me, I felt that familiar shrinking feeling when the jock's oppressive presence drew near. And yet many of the frat boys and jocks shared an open secret we always knew as a down low. I never played that game, but some folks in my new queer circle held all the secrets and did not mind sharing. College did offer some new opportunities and options for love. Critical analysis of Foucault and queer theory opened my mind. Education became a space of praxis, bringing theory to life and loving. Aside from hitting the books, I also used that time to get the sheets. Love, exploration, and self-acceptance all walked hand in hand. Although I ran on my high school track team and had always been physically fit, the university gym helped fill out my body and boosted my confidence along with my biceps. The images of emaciated strange fruit dangling from the faggot tree faded as I found love for my body, mind, and spirit, and I experienced my first real love for a man. It was my lifelong love of jazz that connected me with my college love affair during sophomore year. Kurt was a tall, dark-skinned graduate student who loved Nina Simone. He was fine, sexy, smart, and smooth as silk as he handed me a Hershey's kiss before leaning in for a kiss of his own. Sometime later, on a long weekend home from college, I took a walk through the old neighborhood, and there was Vince. Instantly, I began to shrink in the shadow of the faggot tree then suddenly, I was no longer invisible. We were both adults now. I was 20 and had come into my own, bulked up and ripped from countless bench presses and bicep curls. I was fit for battle and in no mood to turn the other cheek. Vince was wearing a black leather motorcycle jacket. I wasn't sure it was him at first. His honey-kissed skin wrapped a taut but slight physique. He had seemed so large back when I felt so small. With my now broad and solid chest puffed out, I fixed my gaze and knew I could wreck shop on Vince for all my boys dangling from the faggot tree. Then I saw those eyes. He stared at me, smiling, and asked, So you're going to hit me now? He leaned in with those intensely beautiful eyes, now glassy with the look of hunger and regret, the brands, the shamed, the vexed, the blessed, and finally I, we, understood. Still wondering, was it true? He's such a gentleman, the pastor. No one never knew. Hope he gets that their therapy, straightens himself and recovers. This has the church shaken. We can't lose another brother. Pastor went to Easterbrook Park just after Sunday service. The word, a taste on his lips. It wasn't dark, but he wasn't nervous. A little bear 
lured him with his pot. Pastor dropped, his pants dropped. The bear a cock withdrew. Said seeing pastor's penis flop was lewd. And... <laughs> Thank you. And the second piece in the book is called We Cannot Forget. Fire, fire, burn them, the fags, the man in back said, head down. The two South American boys ignored him. The bus seat under me warmed. Fire, fire, burn them, the fags, I heard an African accent. The two South American boys ignored him. The smell of burning flesh swallowed the air. Fire, fire, burn them, the fags. The man jumped up and off the bus. We, black people, were hung in poplar trees and burned black for being black. We cannot forget that. We cannot forget. <laughs>